get another test back in the afternoon, um, you know, and you got a B plus on it. And, and how are you going to feel when you go home? Or what are you going to focus on? You know, and most people are going to, you know, for a lot of folks, focus on that C, right? That is the, you know, if we really think about the threat in the environment. And so there's an adaptive response, which is to say, this feels uncomfortable. Let me give whatever this discomfort is some attention so that I can reduce that discomfort. Um, Barbara Fredrickson uh, has done a fair amount of work looking at negativity and positivity biases. Um, and we really need, for most people, about a ratio of three to one, three good things to happen to every one negative event, right? And I just highlight that as an example of one of the biases that we're, we're all generally um, somewhat faulty or, or guilty of falling victim to. Um, but really what I want to highlight is this codex, which is that uh, we could spend the next however many years trying to unravel how many of these biases play into our um, decision making. And the fact of the matter is that all of them do to some to one degree or another. Right. Um, and so really, our question is, how do we become either aware of the specific bias itself or the type of thinking that leads us down that path of you using incorrect or faulty ways of making decisions? Right. So we'll come back to that in a minute. And then our heuristics, right, uh, are really just simple rules of thumb, right? Uh, that they, they are um, essentially encoded um, over time. They are patterns that we recognize as we grow and develop and learn in our environments. And then when we are faced with either the same or a similar situation, we use a small number of cues to arrive at what is generally an optimal decision. And I, I think grocery stores are probably the best example of this, especially having just rushed through one right before this meeting. I did not plan my, my afternoon and evening well. I thought I had more time than I did. Um, and I used a, a, an inordinate number of heuristics to navigate right, that grocery store and to get out with mostly the things that I needed. Right? I did not sit there and think completely rationally and you know, weigh the cost benefit analysis of, let's say, you know, uh, crest toothpaste versus some other type of toothpaste, to, whether I'm looking at it via price or the ingredients, et cetera, right? I said, I've been using this toothpaste for a long time. It's good enough. Great. Let's grab it. Plus, I like the color red and their marketing department did a great job. Sucker me in. Onward. Here we go. We got to get back home for that presentation. Okay. Um, so heuristics have gotten a bit of a bad rap, but if we didn't have those automatic processes, we'd kind of be in big trouble. It'd be really hard to navigate our days. All right. So. Here's our first, I think, big, um, you know, concept or idea that we, we need to tackle in terms of decision making. Um, and that is that, that we really don't do this in isolation. And by this, I mean, you could, you could just replace backcountry skiing with, with almost anything, right? Um, you know, and this is, we're reading a quote here um, from someone who's looked at the social brain hypothesis. All right, and I'll go through that in a minute, but uh, essentially what we need to recognize is that for better or worse, the people around us, or, and this is really key, the people that we imagine to be a part of that system, right? And, and, and the reason that's key, and again, we don't have a lot of data um, or research behind this. So if somebody's got a lot of time and energy out there, we could use this, uh, this information, but um, our decision-making is influenced by who we think might be watching us. Right. So think about that through the lens of social media. Okay. Um, but back to the social brain hypothesis, essentially our brains relative to our overall body size are quite large um, and, and uh, more so than the vast majority of, the, of other organisms. And that's because we don't do a lot of other things very well. Um, you know, again, I always used to joke with my students, like we've got a prefrontal cortex, opposable thumbs, and we're pretty okay at running long distances, especially once we figured out how to carry water. But beyond that, um, we don't fly all that well, we don't swim all that well, um, we certainly don't sprint all that well with the exception to a few people. Um, so our evolutionary adaptations, right, are really, um, you know, our social networks, right, and our ability to think um, or to navigate those social networks effectively. And I want to add one more layer on top of that, which is that if we imagine a timeline going back um, three million years, right? It's really in the last, and I promise you, we're not gonna dive into a, a long discussion about climate change, uh, human caused or not. Um, it's really in the last million years that we've seen um, 
you know, the, the, the greatest degree of climate fluctuation, right? So, so this is important because what we see in the last million years and really probably, uh, you know, 800,000, right, is a very complex and a very dynamic, I'm using those words intentionally, but a very complex and very dynamic system that human beings, um, that our species had to navigate. So what did, they, what did we do in response? Well, we enlarged our social networks, right? We relied upon each other and our brains grew in size quite rapidly relative to the previous, you know, 2 million years, 3 million years, right? Grew quite rapidly to, you know, incorporate this new knowledge, this new information. So I think when we introduce heuristics, at least in my own very subjective, you know, non-scientific teaching uh, experiences um, or, or data collection, I would see, you know, you'd go through those lists of heuristics and then when you would get to the ones that are like, you know, acceptance heuristic and people are like, nah, that's not really, that's not really for me. Right. You know, the kind of that, that like, like I got that rugged individualism thing going down. Right. Um, pe other people don't, don't affect how I behave. Um, and, you know, if we look at social facilitation, it's like, man, nah, not really, I'm not too worried or concerned. Now, to be sure, each person's psychological makeup is different. We're not trying to say that everybody has the exact same, you know, um, you know, coding as the person next to them, but in general, it's actually pretty adaptive um, to be, uh, you know, in concert with the decision making of the people around us. Um, and one of the best, and I think if for any area instructors or guides that are listening tonight, um, you know, I think one of the best tools that we were given across that, that evolu evolutionary time span is what's called theory of mind, right? And this is something that we do much, much better than, than uh, pretty much any other organism, at least the, as far as we know. Um, um, but that is the ability around the ages of four or five, we developed the ability to look at the world um, with relative accuracy through somebody else's um, lens. How might, the, how might they be experiencing this uh, situation either in the current moment or how might they experience it in the future? Right? So this is a wonderful tool that I think that uh, we can maybe more consciously tap into, particularly when we are in uh, leadership positions. Right? Uh, we probably do it unconsciously a fair amount of time, but I think as a decision-making tool, it's really important because a lot of times we'll see people, again, who are making decisions uh, that may not be in their best interest, but they want to go along with what the group is saying. But if we really analyze their behaviors and think about what it might be like to be that person on that slope at that time, all right, we can probably safely assume all right, that, that that wouldn't be the decision they'd be making if they were just left to their own, you know, again, in a vacuum, essentially. Okay, um, so our brains are wired to work, function well with other people, okay? uh, and that can be a phenomenal adaptation, okay, or that can be a source of, of stress. So here's our first question for the evening for all of us, whether again at a recreational level or professional level, um, is really what are the stress levels that we are introducing or mitigating in our groups, you know, on an hour to hour, day to day, uh, month or week to week, month to month basis, right? And what's really important about the table that we're looking at right now is that we see two things um, happening simultaneously, right? Um, one, all right, obviously passive tasks and motivated performance, all right, those are cortisol levels, which is our primary stress hormone, all right? They don't, they don't rise too much, all right? But the, the moment that we lose a degree of agency, Right? So we have motivated performance with uncontrollability. So motivated performance, meaning I have agency in that I am preparing for this event, I'm preparing for this task, and then some outside variable, i.e. a mean instructor or a mean teacher steps in and says, all right, that test that you had an hour to complete, now you've got half an hour, you got 15 minutes, right? All of a sudden we lose agency over that situation because we can't control the amount of time in which we can complete that task, right? And so now we see cortisol levels rise a little bit. That's okay for the most part though, right? We're not pushing ourselves into the place where all of a sudden we lose that higher order thinking, right? That we developed over the last 400,000, 500,000 years up until the present moment. Then we take that a step further, right? We have motivated performance with social evalu evaluative threat. Now this is key, right? Essentially what this is saying, right? is that, yeah, I still have motivation to participate in whatever the activity is here, but now I'm starting to worry about how the people, again, either real in my environment in the moment or imagined those outside of the, the current domain, but who might see what I'm doing, how they're gonna perceive me 
and if I'm going to lose some type of social status or grace that I might have already earned, right? Or that I might want to earn. And now we see cortisol levels really rise, right? And then, you know, obviously, last but not least, right, we have our motivated performance with um, basically that social threat and, uh, you know, and basically we cannot control our environment. And that is essentially the worst case scenario, right? And that is when cortisol levels really rise. And we really, if you were to look at, um, you know, the Yerkes Dodson law or that kind of very classic, it's called inverted U theory, but it's really just um, a bell curve, <laughs> a bell curve of stress. And that's really when we move into a place of anxiety and our decision-making optimal decision really starts to slip and erode, right? We, we are now in that fight or flight mode and it's really difficult, um, you know, again, to make an, an optimal decision. So the task ahead of us, I think, especially as again, leaders, instructors, guides, right? I don't know why that's, there we go, come back. Here we go. Okay, um, is to ask ourselves what type of culture are, are we creating in our groups, All right? So, thank you, Wikipedia. Also, if by any random chance um, a senior from three years ago in my class who, when when I asked for APA um, APA format, just put in Wikipedia as their citation. Uh, tip of the hat to you. Uh, we're paying that forward. <laughs> but if you're listening by any chance, thank you. Um, so a cultural norm serves as a template for expectations in a social group, right? And then thank you, Margaret Wheeler. Uh, I think probably anybody uh, who has taken an area course this year with me will know that we have started each, each course, each class with this saying, which is that culture eats systems for breakfast, right? So if we go back, oh, sorry, I don't know why the arrow's on, here we go. So if we go back two slides, right? The cultural norm that we create right, as again, especially as leaders, all right, has a huge impact on whether or not we are facilitating a, an experience in which optimal decision-making can really occur, right, or are we facilitating one, right, that forces those cortisol levels to rise to a level, forces those stress hormones to rise to a level where the optimal decision-making, right, can no longer happen, right, and so we have a task set before us, what are our cultural norms? Right. Well, what what are our expectations, both um, small and, and large? Right. So so once this meeting's over, um, you know, or this discussion, this very one way discussion uh, is over, um, I'm going to jump on a phone call and talk to some friends about uh, you know skiing in, in in the next few days. Okay. And then we'll have our our our, our micro you know our small group norms. Right. Um, I'll say one of the tools, and we'll look at this at the end that I really appreciate about uh, over the years, I've grown to appreciate about the, the one of the norms in that particular group is that uh, there's a lot of freedom for what we call task friction, right? So we can disagree on the means by which we, we might want to go achieve a particular goal, but that task friction doesn't, um, at least my own experience, maybe if some of the, <laughs> some of the folks are listening, they might disagree, uh, doesn't then become interpersonal friction. And again, I won't go back through the slides to explain why that's a problem, but remember, uh, the interpersonal friction is oftentimes perceived as one of the greatest threats and one of the biggest inhibitors to optimal decision making, right? So task friction in our groups, that can be okay. But when that becomes interpersonal friction, we need to start thinking about, again, what are our norms, right, in this particular environment? All right. So number two, this is more for the individual level. Um, Flow psychology, uh, and this is again, just a very loose unscientific observation I've made in my own behaviors. Um, but, but flow psychology has gotten a, a, a ton of press in the last few years, as I said at the beginning. And, and really in simple terms, all it is, is is matching our skill or competencies with the demands of the environment, okay? Um, and if our demands of the environment meet the skills that we have, we enter this state, which is typically you know described as we lose a sense of ego. Um, you know, we uh, feel as though time is either, you know, speeding up or slowing down. Um, we feel that we have mastery over everything that we're doing. Um, we feel a high degree of efficacy, right? Um, it, it is a really pleasant uh, experience to be in. And we are fully, you know, the key one is we are fully in the moment, right? We're not worried about emails. We're not worried about, um, you know, what's going to happen tomorrow. We're not worried about anything really we're just almost moving on autopilot it's a phenomenally creative um and for some people like myself uh and i'm using this word intentionally intoxicating state to be in 
And the reason I say that is that uh, the way that my particular brain works um, as somebody with pretty profound ADHD is that when I am in a flow state, all right, it is one of the rare times where all of a sudden all the puzzle pieces of the world just lock up and make sense. Right? So in, in environments where some might say, well, that's kind of hectic and crazy and, and stress inducing, uh, you know, and, and might force some people to feel uncomfortable, uh, for my brain, it's actually, uh, and for, I think for a lot of other folks, or some folks, um, it's actually a really, really um, enticing place to be, right? But this comes with, because of the environment that we choose to play and recreate in, an inherent danger, right? So let's play out for a second the requirements piece, right, on that y-axis. If I continue to amplify the requirements, right, so my skills right, start to step up. Well, now all of a sudden the requirements better step up. As a skier, that means, right, that all of a sudden the terrain that I'm skiing and riding, the conditions in which I'm skiing and riding also have to start to increase to match that skill, unless I get very creative, right? And I would say it's taken me many years to really figure this out. I think I would, if I were being truly honest, it would just be like seeking those flow states uh, uh, as often as humanly possible, uh, much to the detriment of probably a lot of other parts of my life, <laughs> um, certainly my bank account. Um, but, um, but, but, but in, in recent years, and especially this year, you know, we can mirror flow states or we can achieve a flow state um, in a variety of conditions. And so I think this is really, really important um, to pay attention to, right? So here's an example, right? Uh, the, the line on the left um, is in uh, Estes or Rocky Mountain National Park. Um, it, it, it is, one of the most uh, beautiful, probably scariest lines that I've had the opportunity to ski. Um, and reflecting on that experience, I would say that my flow state most likely really started uh, the night before when it was like very like conditions lined up. It was real. This is happening. There was really nothing that entered my conscious awareness in terms of like, you know, what matters next week? What matters? Like it is a singular focus in the moment in the zone for probably about a 24-ish plus hour time span. Um, some people might say that uh, you can't be in a flow state for that long. Um, I would argue that you can be in, in either light versions or, or fully developed versions of that state for an extended period of time, right? Um, the key is that you'll see in the quote here above is that while I'm in that state, my ability to monitor my own thinking, right? That metacognitive awareness, which is a, again, a very unique element of, of, of that we possess as human beings or the skill that we possess as human beings, that begins to shut down, right? And, and it makes sense, right? If, if I'm really consciously thinking about my own thinking while I'm trying to achieve a peak performance, it, it's gonna fall apart pretty quickly. We, we all, and any athlete at any level will tell you that, that you really, the best performance is gonna be the ones that are kind of on autopilot, all right? Um, so it's important though, because these behaviors, these actions that we choose to take, skiing and riding down a hill, they don't exist in a vacuum, right? So uh, as wonderful as that line on the left is, all right, I can, again, achieve that same state, all right, through the line on the right, which is a sneaky powder day in the Colorado backcountry um, on about a 28 degree slope. Uh, and, and I do not have to incur, right, the, the risks associated, all right, with the one on the left, right? So, Again, I think at an individual level, just really being aware and conscious of, of, of you know, am I chasing this, this incredibly euphoric feeling, um, which, which are our flow states, right? And then they're wonderful, they're incredible to experience. Uh, and if I am, uh, to what detriment, right? Because uh, we know that that, that that critical analysis, that system two thinking that's really required um, is really hard to tap into in those states. And so maybe it might be, um, you know, something like the other day, um, and I really mean this, like, you know, asking myself, how many turns can I make down the shirt, right? Um, and under the conditions that we currently have, it was actually pretty challenging because most of it was ice, all right? Um, and then this brings us into this idea of propagation, right? So again, our symptoms of flow, we just went over it, but I want to highlight two of them. We are fully immersed in the present moment. And then this is really key, our other needs go unnoticed. You, you know, a lot of interviews and a lot of surveys done with people who are in flow states, they'll be like, oh yeah, I forgot to eat. I forgot to drink water. Now here's a key one, also forgetting the needs of other people that we love and care about, right? And this is a big one, this is a hard one to admit, right? I like think of myself as a generally sensitive person, but if I'm being very honest, right? 
Um, there's a lot of times when I am not thinking about the needs of other people around me, right? I am fully present in that moment and I am just, I'm a skier, right? And, and I'm doing my thing. Um, and so the, the need to feel connected, right? Let's see if this works. Oh, yes, it did, right? Um, it, it is one that we can't forget about for, for, for a variety of different reasons. So my, my hypothesis, my, my, you know, again, I'd love some help with this. Maybe we'll sit down and chat next year at Esau, but that we should be as concerned with how the events that we initiate propagate, right? So we're going to borrow some terms from our, our snow science friends. How do they propagate across time? All right. So we should be as concerned with that as we are with propagation in the snow path, right? Now, this may seem very simple. You're like, oh, okay, great, Blake. But, all right, we aren't very good at that. Okay, um, hold on one second. Okay, um, we really struggle to imagine future realities for ourselves, right? So one of the tools that we can use, all right, when we're trying to imagine future realities is a reframing of risk tolerance to loss tolerance, okay? And Joe, if you can just let me know um, if the audio doesn't go through and also heads up to uh, anybody that might have kids in the room, uh, there are a couple swear words in this video, um, so just, you know, your mouths or ask them to just step out for two seconds. But again, here's an example of somebody navigating the likelihood of an undesired event propagating across time, right? And doing some pretty incredible skiing while they're at it. Yeah, audio is good. Oh. Yeah, this oh. your this one looks nice and cruisy. Yeah, yeah. This is this, this is mellow cruise. <laughs> so I got to go around the big knob, and then pretty much a straight line to the cliff. Oh my god! Holy shit, Michael! Yeah, I'll, I feel it. I'll see what happens. But I feel I feel good. I feel I feel like you know, I feel like there's zero risk of dying. A fair chance of getting hurt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's and that's sure. like that I can live with, you know. Yeah. Drop in. Looks so good, your line. Wow. It looks nice. Yeah, it looks so good. Where, what is Nico doing? He's doing oh, he's going to do the big line. With the drop? Yeah, so we're pretty far away if something happens. <sighs> oh, Lord. Look at this. Oh, Nico. What? They took out the whole touchy. thing. That was a little touchy. <laughs> I think we can still go left. Yeah, that's touchy. You can still go left if you want. Yeah, I'll just ski this cool R here. I think today is not the day. No, no, no. I think I'm just hungry, you know? Yeah. <laughs> All right. I, I, I like that, that piece of... Uh, <laughs> um, Oh la la! Yeah, this, senor. this one looks nice and cruisy. Yeah, yeah. All right, let's see if we can move. It. There we go. All right. Um, so what Nikola is doing there um, is essentially, you know, especially at the top of that line, uh, other than incredible skiing, um, it is is reframing as he's looking down the line, reframing uh, that that. Um, that assessment of risk into something that's quite honestly, and I don't know, it'd be great, you know, maybe sometime, you know, interview and say, you know, what did you mean by that comment? Uh, but really looking at uh, his tolerance for loss, as opposed to saying like, oh, well, 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 I have, you know, um, you know, I have a high risk tolerance. Right? Uh, I, I think culturally, and I mentioned this last year at Esau, I, I think having a high risk tolerance is almost like a badge of honor. Um, but when we reframe that and say, well, what is my my, my, what am I willing to lose in this endeavor? And Nikolai does a great job there. He said, well, you know, I might break a few bones. And, and for him under those conditions and where he's in his life, that, that's an acceptable loss. Doesn't feel like the likelihood, again, his own assessment, I'm not on the sharp and making decisions, uh, you know, 
that the likelihood of, of, of dying is, is very high. And so it's an acceptable loss to potentially break a few bones on the way down, right? Um, you could analyze that in terms of the slope aspect and this small slide that he kicked off, um, you know, uh, whether or not it's good decision making, but it's a much more honest way of assessing what might happen if things go wrong here, right? Um, and it, again, if I'm being totally honest, one of, one of the, you know, I'll, I'll use, uh, obviously not nearly as, as hectic a line as that, um, but um, an example recently, my own decision-making of, uh, you know, had a day off, uh, went out into the field, went to collect, uh, you know, some, some observations, uh, both for myself and try and contribute to uh, the observations that, you know, uh, the, the avalanche center is collecting. And, you know, it was pretty clear just based on my, you know, pretty quick hand shears and compression tests. I'm like, you know, I didn't even feel like I was like, I don't think I need to dig the full ECT here. Like it's a pretty touchy snowpack, right? At least at that time. And then I looked up and both right gully and lobster claws seemed like they would be really fun. And for about half a second, my brain went into that place where it was like, well, if I ski under that rock and I let the skis literally, like I let the skis run a little bit, um, I can tuck underneath and then, right. And so I call like reinventing the wheel, um, you know, and what interrupted that thought process, right. Is that not only the potential loss that I might incur, but that propagation across time was knowing the people, right. That would have to come up and get me if something went wrong. And that gave that decision, the emotional salience that at least for me, I needed right? To be like, this is a dumb idea. Turn around, go home and come back another time when you've got everybody in your crew, right? And again, we know that just from a wide variety of studies, sorry, we'll just kind of get back to the screen here for a second, um, both in economics and psychology, that our losses feel worse, all right? They feel more intense than our gains do. So we can use this to our decision-making advantage, even though it may not feel that way. It might feel like, oh man, if I you know, really pin it down the head wall in perfect conditions, the gains that I'm going to get from that are going to feel really good. They might feel good, but the losses, if we incur a loss, are going to feel a lot worse. So those two things are not equivalent. And it's really important to keep that in mind as part of our decision-making equation. Um, and I honestly uh, should have had this slide actually before the one of, of the awesome skiing, uh, but I just want to go back to that propagation piece. Um, again, we, we have a really hard time imagining ourselves in future states all right, um, it, it, it is you know, uh, near impossible to get an accurate depiction of who we're gonna be in 10, 15 years. We can obviously generally for the most part look in reverse order and, and be like, oh yeah, okay. So that's who I was and here I, who I am now and things are going all right. But then projecting out in the future is really tough for us uh, as evidenced by uh, you know, yours truly here um, who was late to the memo about wearing helmets uh, while you go backcountry skiing. Um, and is doing a phenomenal job of sporting um, an avalung that is not in their mouth, which uh, just to dispel any myths out there, um, if you're gonna use an avalung, you gotta have it in your mouth. The idea that you would get caught in an avalanche, grab it off your chest, put it in your mouth as you're tumbling through uh, you know, the proverbial washing machine, uh, it's not really gonna happen, right? So um, if you want more of a lesson on that, Al Mandel uh, has, has a phenomenal description. I really mean that uh, of driving home that point. Um, I will say, because we don't want to just focus on all the negative, um, that uh, we are also skiing a 28 degree slope in really great snow. Um, Northern Idaho, May 10th, uh, has, the, has the ability to produce that type of skiing. Um, so there are some good decisions going on there. But I'm certainly not thinking about having this discussion with you all tonight. Um, I'm just thinking about enjoying some really nice snow, right? And so finding opportunities to imagine what we might want our future selves to be like, right? Uh, or to experience is also a helpful decision-making tool. And then the good news, I just wanna make sure I'm, oh yeah, perfect, right on time, all right? Um, I know that like after half an hour, the eyes glaze over and it's like, well, there's a lot of listening, I'm jumping all over the place here. Um, but the good news is um, most people, right, are, in, um, are doing exactly what we'd expect them to do um, and that the vast majority of people, and by people, I mean backcountry skiers and riders, right? So let's get really specific here. Most backcountry skiers and riders um, are, are, are actually doing the right thing. And I'll give a, a, a really good example of, of this kind of paradigm that we have 
Um, and then I'll, I'll explain that with a little bit of, of data with an asterisk next to it, because I'm really just, um, you know, glossing over Jerry Johnson's uh, ongoing research. Um, but I'll give a, a specific example, which is this past Sunday, teaching an avalanche course, we see, um, you know, a, a, an avalanche that is triggered by the party ahead of us, right? And Monday rolls around, I sit down, I write out a, a, a report of, of how we perceive that those events unfold, but I ignored a really important detail. And the detail that I ignored and I didn't put in that report is that halfway up the Gulf of Slides Trail, we ran into a tele skier. Uh, yes, we care that you tele. <laughs> um, we ran into a tele skier, um, solo rider, who was on their way down the hill, stopped to talk to us. I asked, so what are conditions looking like? So actually, they're looking pretty good. And, um, you know, I really wanted to go up there and at least ski the bottom half of gully number one, but I'm by myself. And, um, you know, I don't have my helmet with me. And, uh, you know, I, I think it'd be okay. And literally, this is almost for He's like, I think it'd be okay, but I'm just not sure if I'm really, you know, you know, will, willing to go, you know, you know, go down that path and that may not be verbatim, but either way, right? And then hooting and hollering, skis away, has a great time going down the Gulf of Slides Trail and ends up back with the car safely, right? And there's no real report, right? In terms of, right, if we go back a few slides in terms of creating a cultural norm to celebrate, right? That good, that optimal decision-making. And I think that that is, there's no answer for it tonight, but there, there's a room, there's room there for us to improve uh, as a community to begin to celebrate some of those stories and narratives. I know Frank and I have talked about a little bit of, you know, maybe integrating some of those decision-making points, those times when we do turn around a bit more into, and let's be honest, our social media feeds, right? That might be a more honest uh, representation of what's actually happening in the field in terms of decision-making, you know, standpoint. Um, than, than just whatever, you know, shot that's wonderfully framed by uh, friends who are far better photographers than I am, right? <laughs> Make my skiing look a lot better than it is, okay? Um, so, and, and then just back to this quote here, most people are doing exactly what you expect them to do. So Johnson has been collecting data using, um, voluntarily, people have opted in, uh, the GPS or tracking the GPS device or, 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 yeah, using the GPS devices in people's phones to see the type of train that they're moving in um, and apologies, you know, uh, you know, Jerry Johnson, if you ever hear this and I'm misquoting you, then we'll have an opportunity to correct this. Um, but using that data to basically see where people are traveling under certain conditions. And again, the numbers show us that most people are doing the right thing most of the time. Okay. So we have a little work to do there. Um, okay. Um, so this is a report that came out uh, last spring looking at user groups. And essentially, it is reinforcing what, what Jerry Johnson is finding, which is that, you know, if our fatality rate were to be in lockstep, right, uh, uh, with the, the explosive growth of skiing, backcountry skiing, we would probably expect about 200 fatalities a year. And, and I'm going to say this right now, like, this is not to minimize in any way, shape or form, um, um, you know, how, uh, you know, Honestly, just profoundly sad the last three to four weeks. I can't, you know, there's no real better or more appropriate words to say have been in the backcountry skiing community, right? And that is not to diminish that in any way, shape or form. It is to say though, that there's a little bit of room for us to, to reflect on the things that we might be doing well. Because if we were really dropping the ball all the time and this weren't working, then we would have a, we would incur far heavier losses than we currently are. So something's going right in the system. It's incumbent upon us to figure out uh, what variable or variables uh, are the things that are going well, okay? Um, and just a quick note though, kind of the other side of that coin, um, we aren't, our brains aren't great with, with big numbers. And as a little exercise, a little experiment, if you have a, a, a pen or pencil, some type of writing implement and a piece of scratch paper near you, um, you can see, you know, this line down here at the bottom, where does 1 billion go on this number line? All right, and if you just want on that scratch piece of paper, just take a guess as to, you know, where does a billion go on that particular number line? And then I'll hit the uh, play button here in a second. Okay. All right, 
So my apologies uh, if, if that harkens back to some math classes that might have been less than optimal experiences. Um, but I just wanted to use that uh, quick demonstration at the end to show that both at a conceptual level, we really struggle with, with imagining large numbers. And, and here's the dangerous part, uh, at an emotional level, we do too. So um, you know, if we go back to this idea of prospect theory that we looked at um, a few slides ago, right? So we look at this curve right here, we see, all right, that our gains, all right, so for both gains and losses, all right, they plateau at a certain point. They don't have the same impact over time. If we continue to accrue or we continue to accrue rather those, uh, those gains and those losses, the emotional salience of that same event, all right, begins to lose its impact. And this is really, really important, right? Because if we are to, hypothesize that there's an alternate reality out there where we're doing it really poorly, all right, we do run the risk of normalizing, all right, essentially in a, a profound amount of loss on a pretty consistent basis, all right? And so prospect theory shows that to us as well as what's called psychic numbing, right? If we see, you know, uh, one person in pain, two people in pain, three people in pain, we are greatly affected by that. If we see thousands hundreds of thousands, millions, we literally, our brains start to numb out, all right, that, um, you know, the, that, that empathy that we have for the people around us, right? It's, it's simply too much for us to really process. So I actually think that our focus on the stories, the narratives, um, all the, the complex details that, that comprise um, the incredible human beings that we have lost at least, you know, this year, any year in the backcountry community, that's really important, right? Because their stories keep us focused. And I worry that while we're doing the right thing, right, that there is, a, again, an alternate reality in which we begin to not allow those stories to be as potent or as to be impactful as they are, right? Um, and, and that's a dangerous place to be. So we can talk about that more some other time. And Last but not least, our summary now that we're 50 minutes in, okay? Um, I know we covered a lot of ground. Again, this is meant to be fodder for a discussion. Some of the ideas may have resonated. Others are like, nah, doesn't matter, right over your head, doesn't matter. Um, I really hope that at some point uh, we can, you know, uh, again, work together, collaborate to continue building upon what McCammon started in 2002 and begin to introduce uh, some new skills into our decision-making uh, framework, again, both before we go into the backcountry, while we're in the backcountry, and when we leave the backcountry. So here are a couple, couple of things in summary. One, we want to build small teams that are guided by adaptive, thoughtful, and accepting cultural norms. Again, looking out for task friction versus interpersonal friction. The former is acceptable, the latter, right, we got to be wary of. As individuals remaining cautious of flow states, okay, um, and really the question that I just asked myself is, could this, feel, this same feeling be achieved in less complex terrain? If I can't, for whatever reason, today's the day, all, all the conditions align, great, let's do it, let's go. Uh, but if there's too much uncertainty, all right, then I'm gonna go find that, pursue that flow state somewhere else. Um, using pre-mortems, right, is, is kind of the tool that I use when I give that example of wanting to ski, other lobster, right, golly of my own, uh, playing out, right, how this might ripple across time, Right, so using pre-mortems to guide sharp end choices and then incorporating somewhat similar loss tolerance questions in to assess our decision making. Right? And then really reminding ourselves that this whole thing doesn't exist in a vacuum. Right? Um, you know, how does this propagate across time? How does it impact uh, the people who are not here on the mountain with me? And again, are those impacts, am I willing to incur them? And again, some of them can be very positive, right? They're, they're, again, I don't want to get, as I just said, too far into the negative, right? Some of them can be very, very positive. And that's the reason a lot of us are going to the backcountry, right? But if we run the risk of, you know, how likely is it that it's going to be a negative event, right? And then how is that going to impact the people around me? And then last but not least, as an entire community, I think that we can multitask. I don't think that this is like, you know, we're doing the right thing all the time. Let's just pat ourselves on the back. And I don't think that we um, need to be, uh, you know, beating ourselves up too much. I think that both things can coexist, which is that we can celebrate our wins. Uh, we can mourn and we should mourn our losses, continue to tell those stories, continue to learn, right? And then we can continue to progress as individuals in the community. And then last but not least, all right, um, this is a quote that I stumbled upon while preparing for tonight, all right? Um, 
but I, I think that there's also um, this hyper focus on making phenomenally rational decisions all the time, which is just not how our brains are wired. And in fact, if they were, um, you know, uh, I know for me anyway, uh, I would not be pursuing with, with the wonderful friends that I have to, you know, climb up a, a giant volcano to try and ride down it. There's not much that's very rational about that. Um, and yet they are the moments, uh, they are the experiences that bring an inordinate, an exorbitant amount of meaning and depth to my life. And so I'm grateful for the fact that there is a bit of irrational decision-making uh, going on uh, in my thought process uh, that allows me again to have these wonderful experiences with a great human being. So uh, with that said, thank you so much for um, you know, the last 50 minutes of your time. Uh, and yeah, if we have time for questions, that'd be great. Great job, Blake. That was super, that was, yeah, that was a deep dive for sure. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, um, we got one question, which is, um, is sort of off topic. So we'll skip it for the moment. But um, one question I got for you is when you're in a group of your close skiing friends, how often are you having that conversation? Are you, um, you know, you talk about hand shears and poking around the snow, all that, but like how, how, how often are you checking in with people on their, their state of mind or what they're thinking or how they're feeling about X, Y, or Z? Yeah, um, um, I, I would say regularly, but it looks very different than what might be happening in, in you know, an area course or a group that I'm not as familiar with, right? Um, you know, uh, just like all of us that, that, you know, you get to know people well enough and their behaviors and even the way that like, you know, they, they are taking steps, right? Or they're turning or they're getting their gear on or they're, they're eating their food or not eating their food. Like all of those things that are part of, again, that theory of mind. Um, I think just in those small groups over time, you, you start to pick up on at a very intuitive level. Um, I would say there are conversations though, um, in those higher consequence ter you know, terrain. And if, you know, Frizz or, or, or Dumpy or Gibbsy, if any of you are listening, feel free to chime in. But like, um, you know, I know, um, you know, diagonal a few years back, um, I still feel kind of bad about this, um, but, but we were in there in all time. I mean, like it was as good as good's gonna get, right? And, I, you know, it, it, it was tough because you don't wanna be, you don't wanna be the person that, that is gonna ruin all time day. Um, but, but spidey senses were just off, right? Like it's just didn't, I'm like, man, if this thing goes wrong, it's going to be real bad. It's going to be the opposite most likely of what, uh, Nikolai said in, in, you know, his little assessment there. Um, and so that was a great point to check in and say, like, Hey, um, let's do, you know, a quick CT because uh, on that line and those conditions, if you did an ECT, you're all of a sudden cutting the entire slope. <laughs> it's not very wide. So, um, you know, put everybody in a safe position. One person, you know, assess the snow and let's see what we get. And we're right in that in between. So we decided like, all right, you know, we'll come back another day. Um, and so, yeah, I, does it happen with the frequency that, that one might expect, you know, in a new group? Probably not. But does it happen, um, you know, uh, a fair amount, absolutely. I think one of the things that people miss out on, and, and I'll shut up, but um, is the amount of conversation that happens before a trip, right? Like that's, I mean, the text thread, like that's just an ongoing seasonal thing. Like that's just like daily, like the number of maps that that, that Frizz is sending to us of like weather updates on a day-to-day -day basis, <laughs> I can't keep track of it. And so there's also like that decision-making process that goes into it, yeah. And we got one here, um, let's see. How does all this knowledge come into play when you are in a back country, in the back country as an instructor? Really good question. Um, again, I'll be honest with you, my, my margins are, are, are very different um, when you're an instructor or, or you know, in any type of leadership role. Um, I would say, you know, when I ask myself the questions of, of you know, basically the responsibility or taking on the responsibility of the group. And I ask those questions like, so how does this play out across time using those pre-mortem decisions or those, those pre-mortem tools? Um, I, I, I would like to think, you know, um, pretty conservative decision-making, right? Um, I am constantly trying to figure out, you know, how this might play out over time. And also um, I think the other one too is, is looking at, you know, 
and this actually ties the two questions together. Um, we don't, I, I hope, and maybe again, my friends might, might disagree with me, but I'm, I'm pretty sure like, I don't feel the same need, um, you know, you know, at, at least that like kind of like um, social critique amongst that small, just that small crew, right? Um, that I might feel if like, you know, I'll use like um, my level two or my level three, right? Like I felt a fair amount, like there were some heavy hitters in those groups. I was like, I was nervous. And, I, and ironically, <laughs> messed up the first like kick turn in my skin track, almost fell over in front of like, you know, these people that I've admired forever. Um, and so I, I think that as an instructor, it's really important to use that theory of mind and put ourselves back in those shoes of what does it really feel like to be this person right now? And maybe you're assuming too much, but I know that for me, um, you know, I would answer with things like, oh, it doesn't matter. I'm here for whatever. Right. It's like, well, OK, <laughs> that's not that's just, that's not really a decision. Right. Um, it's not anybody's fault. Um, it is just how, again, I can go all the way back to the beginning of the presentation is how we're wired. Right. So. Well, here's one from Rich. Uh, do you see the Dunning effect at play with new backcountry travelers who recently participated in avalanche education course? Also, using the North American Avalanche Danger Scale, what is the danger and likelihood of attending a Zoom meeting sitting at Harvard Cabin? <laughs> Wait, <what was that? laughs> two, it's two part question. So yeah, answer the first one, that first part first. Um, so, so, so remind me again, Rich is asking about the Dunning-Kruger effect, um, which honestly is um, escaping me right now, um, which is mildly embarrassing, but... Um, but it's associating that with level one avalanche. Yeah, new backcountry travelers who recently participated in an avalanche course. Um, yeah, I'm gonna have to um, pass on that because I'm not gonna be able to speak eloquently about it um, or honestly about it. And the next okay. one is? The, the next one is something about watching a Zoom meeting at Harvard Cabin, so. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Uh, any thoughts on whether risk taking in the mountains is increased among those of us who carry the experience of trauma slash death? Oh, oh man, um, that's a great question. Seems a little bit related to the Dunning Kruger effect in my mind, but flipped on its end. Right, most people that would experience trauma or death or some loss in the mountains would experience a, um, you know, a adversity to taking greater risks. Um, but I suppose, from Gabe's point of view, maybe living th through some sort at peace with it might not affect your risk taking ability. Um, yeah, not not quite sure what to do with that. Yeah, I, I mean, riches. Yeah. sorry, I just want to pause because that, that's a very honest question, a really important one. Um, so I'll speak from my own experiences. Um, I would say that, uh, um, you know, I'm being completely honest, that, that um, I've experienced a, a high degree of, of loss of, of friends, all of whom below the age of 40 in a very short period of time. And this is a sample size of one, very subjective. Um, my decision making in the two years of being in the midst of that was not optimal. And I found that my reaction to those losses was to increase um, my risk and decrease my, uh, well, what I perceived as acceptable losses. That's again, my own experience. Um, I, I think that the domain in which those losses occur are very important. And so kind of as Frank is alluding to, uh, there, there could be some, some very different reactions. In fact, I know uh, Caroline Gleit, um, who lost her stepbrother in Avalanche, discusses this exact question in the most recent uh, Outside Magazine podcast interview. Um, and I think that she had a very different reaction to how she traveled in the backcountry, um, you know, in the, in the wake of that loss. So. I'm not sure if that answers the question, but I would say decision making one way or another is definitely effective. Yeah. And, and it's not a static, you know, binary choice. It's, you know, after years, you may revert back to your old self. You may never get back to yourself. You may change completely. You know, it's, it's not 
it's a day by day, month by month um, change in someone's personality or decision making. Yep, absolutely. Frank, anything to add? It likely on that? exists along, along that. I was just say it likely exists along that continuum too, and depending on your age and other factors in your life, mm -hmm. for sure, and your risk tolerance on their spectrum, and there may be um, some might say uh, younger folks could re-exert control over their risk and actually be in some state of denial or um, attempt to remain unaffected to the point of being a little blase about the risk taking um, after those losses, you know, in order to like steel themselves against, um, you know, feeling those losses. Yeah, that avoidance can be pretty, uh, can express itself in pretty profound ways, for sure. Yeah. Can being Good incredibly question, in, um, sorry, lost you there, Frank. I'm gonna just jump to the next question. Um, can being in, incredibly in tune with your crew and their unspoken warning signals ever cross the threshold in a group think? How do you navigate that or brace for that? Great question. Um, I know, again, I, I wish there are other people, so I'm not speaking for everyone. Um, I know that in my own mind, um, that's that metacognitive awareness of, of really, like, I honestly, um, like, I, I'll just check in with myself that when's the last time I asked, you know, like, dump your phrase around, when was the last time I asked somebody like a serious question? Like, it wasn't just like movie quotes, or, you know, right? Like, you know, and, 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 and not just, um, you know, not just like, oh, like, what do you think about this? But what do you think about this particular wind slab on this particular part of the slope. So when we get specific like that, we're really forcing ourselves and other people, um, you know, into, um, you know, into the narrowing into like, like what the actual problem is versus like, ah, how do you feel about this? I feel great. Okay, cool. Um, you know, but that's a really good question, right? And this one that like just requires constant monitoring and updating, right? I mean, so, it, you know, kind of tangentially tied to that is like, you know, th there are days where, where, you know, we spend a lot of time as instructors um, and leaders, like where you're making a ton of decisions. And sometimes I find myself that I want to be involved in group thinking in my own groups. because I'm just I'm like, yo, I, I'm just making so many decisions. So like, you know, for, you know, so much of the week, I'm like, I just want to show up my crew and just go and ride. Right. And, and, and honestly, like under certain conditions in certain environments, that can be totally fine. But if we're going to go, you know, try and tackle something that's pretty complex, I, I, it is my responsibility and anybody else's responsibility to show up, you know, with the ability to challenge group thing. That's a really good question. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Allison Osius uh, asked the question, was it worth it in her article, Murder Ball? It's easy to answer yes or no after the fact, but what if we insisted on asking the question, will it be worth it without knowing the outcome? Maybe that would give us a small amount of time to think clearly. Yes. Not a good question, but. Well, I mean, and the worth it piece kind of taps into the why. And I think, you know, like with the answer that Zahan gave the other night, I thought was one of the best is like, is it worth it? It's like, well, well, what is my ultimate goal here? Right. And my, my you know, again, if I'm being very honest, my, like there are some days where my ultimate goal is to just be in nature. So in terms of like, was it worth it to, you know, go into this phenomenally complex terrain and put myself like, no, it wasn't because that wasn't my goal, right? <laughs> like, like that had nothing to do with like, my goal was to just be in the mountains. There's a million different ways that I could achieve that goal, not just this one myopic one. Um, I think, you know, in terms of the gains or losses, right? We, you know, it, it's pretty hard to imagine alternate realities. So it's like, was it worth it? Yeah, I won or, you know, no, it wasn't worth it. Um, forecasting that, I think the best that we can do is assume that we would like the most positive <laughs> outcome possible uh, down the road and then behave in a way um, that incorporates things other than just the gain or loss associated with pointing the skis downhill, right? So the gain or loss of like, I don't know, like I've got a lot of projects around this house that I'd like to finish, <laughs> but it like really bluntly, like there's a lot of other stuff that makes me me and that I want to accomplish that, are, that have nothing to do with sliding downhill, so. And it goes back to your experience in golf of slides with that yeah. telemark skier, right? Yeah. You, you had a great day. You know, maybe, maybe it wasn't exactly what he wanted, but it was a lot better than 
Whatever. I don't know. That person seemed incredibly happy. <laughs> Maybe it's because they're on tele boards, but. <laughs> well, I think that goes, you know, I think we experienced that a lot here in our back country is that people are coming up with, they're driving from wherever. I'm going to go ski left gully today. And there's not a lot of flexibility between when they leave their house and when they get to the floor of Tuckerman Ravine. And that, I feel like that needs to be a major shift as far as like being able to change that decision-making at any point during the day. And, you know, we see it a bunch in the spring, right? Yeah. I'm going to go ski the lip. I'm going to go ski the lip, no matter what condition it's in. Right. <laughs> and, you know, if it's raining or it's locked up, what, you know, so that, yeah, changing your goals. Right. So you still have a positive outcome. Yeah. And I would just add to that. And like, the other thing too is like like i think also honoring and respecting that people are like like in, in different decision making states like just because we might have made a different decision than that person under those conditions doesn't mean that those were the ideal decisions for that person under those conditions right like like, like we we and i'm very guilty of this is like you know you look back and you see something you see an accident and you're like oh man like i would never do that it's like but then there's tons of stuff that i do that people are like that's the dumbest thing i've ever seen Right. Like, so uh, it, it, to assume that like this, this, that, that there's some like nirvana of like, you know, consistent decision making across for all of us as skiers and riders across like the same exact conditions is, is, is impossible. It's not, I don't think a realistic goal. So I think having some compassion for people too, when, when, you know, they, they run into a mistake or error, uh, you know, is really important. Good point. Uh, in the video, the rider essentially decided he was okay with getting hurt to a point of possibly needing rescue broken bones, but not okay with death. Do you think a conversation happened with the rest of the group, whether their risk tolerance was in line with this, considering they would be the ones burdened with having to deal with the rescue? Yeah, really good question. Um, you know, and, and I think that that person at the bottom of the line even says like, we're, we're a ways away if something goes wrong here. It's gonna take a minute to get to, uh, you know, Nico if, um, uh, or Nikolai, if something does does go wrong here. Um, you know, I, I, I'm gonna hope uh, and assume that that conversation um, happened beforehand, but I don't know enough about their crew and their conversations to, to you know, uh, speak eloquently about that. I would say that that's also a cultural norm of, of, you know, bringing everything that you need to help keep each other, you know, safe. And, uh, you know, maybe, you know, at least for me, like uh, put bones or, or, or flaps of skin back where they belong. If something does go wrong, uh, should be a part of, of what you expect out of the people that you're traveling with in the back country. Um, but yeah, that's a great question. It almost seemed like when they were watching him, they were like, oh, you know, they were nervous and they're like you know we're way out here almost yeah. like they were just coming to that realization like oh if things go bad it's going to be really bad yeah so certainly the, certainly the first year is like yo is he really going for that big air <laughs> right. yeah yep. Yep. um what other realms aviation military etc do you find most you got a good question from Sorry, I Frank, lost. Frank's got a tough internet connection. So go ahead, Frank. Oh, uh, I was just gonna respond to a, the anonymous person who said, how do you know when you're experienced enough to trust your intuition? Seems like even 20 years experience may not prepare you for all the backcountry experiences that you might have. I think it's important to, to consider that your intuition is something that you train everyone's intuition is a product of their, their environment and and work they put into training that intuitive everyone should be suspicious of their intuition if it's not well-rounded because we're all subject to negative feedback loops where we never really get the appropriate feedback to bad decisions we just get away with things we get lucky so <laughs> Be wary of people with tons of experience or proclaim they have a ton of experience. Um, and wear that in yourself too. The, the question of intuition is really, you know, um, Jimmy Stratton and I had a conversation about this a few years ago. Like, um, 
it, again, I, I, I like, you know, it's kind of like the debate of like, oh, snow science or human factors. It's like, well, well how about both? Right. Like, like ideally, like we're, we're getting the best out of both. It's like the same thing with like, you know, rational system two, rational for the most part, system two thinking versus more intuitive thinking. Like th there are times and places where we really need both of those skills. Like, like think about into like for the most part, I, I kind of joke with people who show up to a level one course, I'm like your intuition is pretty good. You're here. We're having this conversation. Right. Like you don't know a lot about backcountry scheme, but you know that like this conversation, this class should probably be happening. So nice job. Like, we don't want to all of a sudden, like, delete that, like, whatever got you here, um, just because now all of a sudden we're going to replace it with some, some nice fancy systems. And at the same time, as Frank said, like, we also want to be really, like, concerned or wary of, like, just leaning on intuition alone, because that has some phenomenal pitfalls to it as well. So I think just having that awareness of, like, am I just making decisions because this, like, feels right and it's intuitive? Um, you know, or, or am I making decisions based off of something that I can quantify and feels a little more secure to me? Um, but then again, like, right, like if you can't quantify it and it doesn't feel good to you, um, still speak up, right? That's a cultural norm. Like, eh, I'm not feeling great right now. And, and I don't have all the answers in the world, but I don't feel great. And there's probably a reason for that. Last question. What other realms, aviation, military, et cetera, do you find most relevant research and experiences that can provide insight or lessons for us with regard to decision making? Um, I mean, I, I, I mean, I don't know. It'd be interesting to, you know, Frank and Joe, what you think. I, I think for me, a lot of stuff that I've been reading um, most recently is actually coming out of the financial industry. Um, and so I think that particularly, um, you know, investment, um, you know, both short and long-term has a lot to teach us about, you know, uh, the accuracy of predictions and forecasting. Uh, certainly it is a, a pretty volatile, uh, environment to play in. Um, I think, you know, and I, I if, uh, Tom, if you're listening, um, interestingly, one that would be fun to explore is actually the realm of gambling, closely associated. Sorry, anybody that's an investment banker, uh, but with with what you know happens on Wall Street, right? Um, and and there's a video. Um, I don't know if anybody remembers Annie Duke, um, but she she has a TED talk. Uh, she was a, I believe, a world champ at poker at one point, um, and then went back and got her master's or PhD in neuroscience. Um, but she, you know, she looks at like the like winning and losing strategies, right? And what that meant for her as a poker player and what that means, you know, in the quote unquote real world. And so, yeah, I think there's a lot um, personally focused on what the financial industry has to teach us, but there's a bunch of other realms. There's a few more questions scattered out in the chat. So I'll grab a few. Um, I think Someone asks, what, what are your thoughts on social media's influence on individuals' perception of risk? Um, it's been hit a bunch lately, but go for it. Yeah, I mean, look, we can have a whole presentation on social media. Um, and, and I don't say that like in a bad way. I'm like, you know, it, it, is it the same as, as Powder Magazine and Backcountry and, and all the magazines we had before? No, it, it, it's de essentially democratized that process, right? It's put it in the hands of, of far more people. And in some ways, even though the algorithms probably are different now, probably make it, made it a bit more equitable so that not everybody has to move and try and live in Jackson Hole to celebrate their wins, right? So, so there's a bit of a like, I don't know, um, positive side for, for some folks. Um, does it represent you know, again, as Frank and I talked about a couple of weeks ago, the entire process. No, absolutely. No, I don't think so. At least maybe, maybe I'm just following the wrong feeds. Um, but I don't, I don't think it gives an accurate picture of, of what it really takes or what's really going on behind the scenes. Um, you know, that being said, I also think culturally we have, we are fascinated. We are fascinated by, by, by wins and achievements. Uh, we are not as fascinated uh, by the um, granular details that it's hooked to get there, right? You look at like Olympic wins as a great example. We'll look at replays of victories over and over and over again, but looking at the monotony of somebody just, you know, doing step ups on the, you know, of course squats in the squat rack is like, no, delete next, delete next, right? So I don't know, I, I think, Insta you know, any social media amplifies that tendency 
but I don't think it's unique to um, just social media. And we got one from your crew. Um, I'll also say it's from uh, Ryan. I'll also say that making a thoughtful call to back off can really feel empowering. You can celebrate your maturity, discipline to hold back your worst impulses. Definitely hate. Definitely have felt grateful to ski with a crew that's always itching to ski, but also willing to step back without hesitation. Yeah. Yeah, I'd agree. <laughs> yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. And a couple, you know, thanks, great job. But also um, going back to the social media, I love the idea of celebrating the right decisions on social media to balance the negativity and shaming we typically see or hear sometimes. Kudos for mentioning that. And that wraps it up on a positive note, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, we finished on a positive. Um, and I, I like to add, like, I, I, I realized I did the opposite of what my thesis advisor asked me to do, which is narrow the focus. Um, but th that was done a bit intentionally. That, so that widespread, like, I really mean it. Like, like, go listen to Jerry Johnson's interview on the Avalanche Hour podcast. Um, you know, uh, he, he probably presents it in a much more eloquent way than, than I can. But we got work to do. And so if there's some part of this discussion tonight that landed, and you're like, look, I think that idea has some legs let's work on it and, and, and let's really try and improve, you know, in a meaningful way, the, the, this human factor side of this so that it can more closely mirror or match the incredible work that people have done on the snow science side. And those are not in opposition to each other. They need to coexist and, 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 and really, um, you know, help each other out in terms of that decision-making process. So um, thank you to everybody who joined tonight. I really appreciate it. Frank, you have anything Good to- job. Thanks for joining us tonight. and. Thanks for all that, um, Blake. That was great. And I appreciate your time and putting that together. And thanks everybody for joining. Thanks, Have a good night. Thank you all. Yep.